Good afternoon. Good afternoon. The question that is asked more than any other question is, what is the secret? What is the secret of harmonious living, abundant living, gracious living? What is the secret of life without strife, without struggle, without warfare? What is the secret of harmonious human relationships? What is the secret of abundant supply? But now, the answer can be given in far less than a sentence. The demonstration is the difficult thing because the answer has been revealed. It's been revealed dozens of times in the last 4,000 years. The answer is the attainment of the fourth dimensional consciousness. That's the answer. It's the full and complete answer and you don't have to add anything to it because there is no other answer. That is the answer, full and complete. The attainment of the fourth dimensional consciousness or the attainment of what they call Christ consciousness or spiritual consciousness. It is uh, what the Japanese in Zen call Satori. Satori is the word. If you understand that word Satori, you have the whole secret. Satori means enlightenment. It means when your human consciousness, which is unenlightened spiritually, when your human consciousness is enlightened, that is, it receives Satori. It is illumined. It's the same consciousness you had all your life, only instead of being in an unillumined state, it is now illumined. Instead of being unenlightened, it is now enlightened. What do you mean by illumined, enlightened? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So it means to be freed. Illumination or enlightenment means to be freed. Freed from what? Freed from the material sense of life. Now that's the only freedom that you can ever attain. Freedom from the material sense of life. What is the material sense of life? It is when your faith, hope, reliance, ambition is in something external. When you believe that life is dependent on a heart, that's a material sense. When you believe that strength is dependent on muscles, that is material sense. When you believe that we live by food alone, that is material sense. If you believe that you need money, this is material sense. If you believe that life began, this is material sense. If you believe that life can be ended, this is material sense. If you believe that life is subject to any thing or any thought, this is material sense. Then freedom, the freedom of illumination is really a freedom from ignorance because it is only ignorance that can believe that our life is dependent on something in the external realm, whereas the truth is that our life governs 
the external realm. To understand that, you must first look at your body and agree that it's yours. And then think of your mind. You can't look at your mind, but you can think of it. And realize that this is yours. And then take the word I and uh, declare that I can think. I can feel, I can move. And then you will see that actually it is I that governs the mind and the body, and not the mind or the body that governs me. Now, in the degree that you realize that I govern the mind and I govern the body, you are illumined and you are free. You are free from the domination of your mind and your body. You have to have that feeling of I. I, self-complete being I, me, I. I am the embodiment of all that God is. All that the Father hath is mine. Because of my oneness with my source, all that is true of the source is true of me, for I and my source are one. Now when you have that, and then you go on to, ah yes, and the mind is given to me as a thinking apparatus so that I can think what thoughts I want to think. If I wish to study mathematics, I can study. If I wish to study uh, literature, I can study literature or philosophy or religion. I, I determine what is going to occupy my mind. True. Since we are human antennas, we are thinking the thoughts that everybody else thinks through us. That is why we sometimes have fears. They're not our fears. They're the universal fears that we're picking up. That's why we sometimes have feelings of sensuality. It's not our sensuality. We're so busy with our studies that we don't have time for sensuality. But sensuality still has time for us. Because the universal mind has a, a way of inflicting itself into our thought. And so it is. It can be fear, it can be sensuality, it can be uh, doubt, loads of things. And uh, until we are aware of I, those things will continue to come in and dominate us. But the domination will get less and less the more we realize I. I and I have a mind and I can decide its thinking and what it shall think and what it shall be interested in. And in the same way I can govern the body and take it where I want it to be. The body cannot talk back to me. Now, while this is merely a hope within us, we are not going to demonstrate it. Even when we come to a place that we agree that it's true, this is not yet illumination. This is not satori. Illumination comes when you can say, oh, whereas before I was blind, now I see. In other words, now I catch it. Now I innerly realize it. That is the difference. When the Master says, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, a lot of people think that that means you shall declare it or affirm it or know it in your head. No, that's the first step. But illumination doesn't take place 
merely by your hearing these words and saying they sound beautiful and I hope they're true, or even, no, I think they're true. No, 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 those are only steps leading up to illumination. Illumination is when that moment of realization comes. That is why Satori, as used in Zen, means a certain occurrence at a certain time. They may have students studying Zen for ten years and not have Satori. They know all that's to be known, but the one thing is missing. And that thing is light, illumination, realization. So it is with us. We wonder sometimes at our lack of demonstration because we've read so many books or heard so many tapes, had so many lessons. But we forget that those are only steps leading up to a certain moment of realization when the veil drops from the eyes. Therefore, remember this. The goal is the attainment of that fourth dimensional consciousness in which we no longer see materially, hear materially, believe materially, but in which we see through the appearance, just as you would see through the appearance of a mirage on a desert. By your superior knowing, you say, no, I don't believe that ocean and I don't believe that city. I see right through the appearance and know that underlying this is just sand. So, where the human being in the third dimension sees a faulty body or a faulty mind and then says, I wish something could be done about it, the fourth dimensional consciousness sees through it. It doesn't mean they're unaware of its existence, but it does not have existence as reality. That's the difference. Even uh, Jesus Christ saw the crippled man. But even while his physical eye saw the crippled man, his inner eye saw through the appearance to the Christhood. Even Jesus knew he was talking to a woman taken in adultery with his physical eye. But with his inner eye, he saw it through to her Christhood and says, Neither do I condemn thee. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, the fourth dimensional consciousness sees not only the beauties of this world, but the discords of this world. But when it sees the beauties of this world, it does not become enthralled, excited. It enjoys them, but as a passing parade. The fourth dimensional mind sees abundance as against lack, but it doesn't get too thrilled about it knowing that it's a passing parade. It's here today, but there's no telling that it might not be gone tomorrow. But the question is, what difference does it make? The reality is still here. What is the reality? The reality is my consciousness. Supposing through my consciousness, I manifest a certain amount of supply or abundance. And supposing for some national or international reason it's wiped away. Now tell me what difference does it make as long as I still have the consciousness that brought it forth. It's the same way as stripping your trees of fruit. What difference does it make as long as you have the tree? 
in due season, it will have another crop of fruit. That is the nature of the tree. But it is the nature of our consciousness to produce itself and reproduce itself, to multiply itself, so that regardless of what out here may be taken away, the substance, consciousness of it remains, and tomorrow it will start to produce it again. Now, the third dimensional consciousness, when it goes broke, tries to jump out of a window, or gets discouraged and takes to drink. Ah, but that is material sense that says there is power out here in those monies or properties or securities. The illumined sense says, no, that's only the fruit on the tree. The substance of the fruit is my consciousness. And whatever my consciousness contains, my consciousness will bring forth. Now, what does my consciousness contain? Well, just remember that God is my consciousness. Therefore, my consciousness contains infinity. So the measure of my bringing forth must be infinite. If, however, I believe that I have a consciousness of my own, and then I try to see, well, what could I bring forth? What education, what experience have I? I couldn't bring forth uh, infinity. Ah, that's right. The third dimensional consciousness or personal sense or material sense measures consciousness from the cradle to the grave. Measures it by your education or lack of it. Measures it by your personal experience or lack of it. But the fourth dimensional consciousness says, I have that mind in me which was also in Christ Jesus because God has not given one of us more of that mind than another. But it takes illumination to realize that. Otherwise, you're going to judge by appearances and hold yourself to your limitation. When fourth dimensional consciousness is attained, even in a measure, life begins to flow more by grace than by effort. More things come easily and more abundantly than ever before. This is one of the signs following. But the secret is attaining the fourth dimensional consciousness. Attaining the consciousness that does not put its faith, hope, or reliance in anything in the external, but realizes that the I of me, the consciousness of me, embraces infinity, and uh, that all of the good flows forth from my consciousness into visible expression. The more we abide in this truth that I have meet the world knows not of, the more we bring infinity, infinite health, infinite abundance, infinite peace into expression. It is like human relationships. Now let us make no mistake about this. There is no way to have a perfect human relationship except to want nothing from anybody. It is an impossibility to want anything from anybody and not have friction develop. I can't be, I don't care how much people love each other. I don't care how closely knit they are the moment you want something of them, a defense mechanism goes up in them. 
and you have the first grain of sand to produce fr friction. And the more you look to others, even for that which is called your legal right or your natural right, the more you're bringing about friction. Therefore, the only perfect human relationship can be is one in which you do not look to anyone for anything. Now, how can you have that consciousness? Only one way. The only one way is if you attain some measure of the fourth dimensional consciousness to where you can say, I and my father are one and all the father hath is mine, and then close your eyes to this outside world. This is the only way that it can be attained. You must, in order to know rightful human relationships, you must make your inner spiritual contact to the point of realization, illumination. Illumination makes free. The moment you're illumined on this subject, you're free of dependence on anyone. Until you're illumined on this, you are dependent on man whose breath is in his nostril, and it is folly to say that you aren't. There has to be this inner conviction if there weren't a soul in the world, I and my father are still one. If I were a million miles from Broadway, I and my father are still one. And uh, my unfoldment must come to me from within. As I abide in that, I am free of dependence on man whose breath is in his nostril then I have a normal happy relationship because being free of looking to anyone for anything, I'm free to share without thinking of any return. Only then, only then have I attained my freedom from man whose breath is in his nostril. The same way. Too many of the people who write to us are still looking for companionships. They're lonesome. It's utter nonsense because if they find companionships, it's very apt to be people who would not be of their own household. It's very apt to be people they couldn't get along with anyhow. It is when we withdraw the gaze from outside companionship to the fact that I can only companion or tabernacle with the spirit within me and actually attain that realization, that illumination, that I'm freed from any need or desire for companionship and then by heaven it floods me from every direction but only from those who are congenial to my present state of consciousness. And of course it would be those who might not have been agreeable to me ten years ago, but they are of my spiritual household today. But I never will get free of needing money or needing companionship or needing a home until I have reached the stage of illumination in which I have no desire for any of that because it's all inbuilt. It's all included in the consciousness which I am. And then on the outer plane, everything takes place according to our state of consciousness. <clears throat> This should make clear to you 
the impossibility while you're working with the message of the infinite way of trying to demonstrate anything or trying to demonstrate any condition because you'll only lose it and you'll lose your freedom. And if you gain something, you'd be so attached to it, you'd be afraid to let it go. Now, in our work, you must not be afraid to let anything go or anyone go. In fact, there should be a period at least once a day of releasing this world. Loose them and let them go. Don't even try to hold on to the truth that you learned yesterday. What sticks with you in consciousness, let it be there. But don't try to make an effort to hold it there because the truth that hasn't yet been revealed is so much more wonderful than any that has been revealed that it would be marvelous if we could empty ourselves every day of all we know and make way for what God has to reveal that man has never even yet received. Uh, we've all been rejoicing these last couple of days in this tell star. Just think not only what it is, but what it tells us of how much more is to come that hasn't yet been revealed to man. I suppose to send a message from here to London today would cost a couple of thousand dollars. And don't forget that in a few years from now we'll be doing it for a dollar. Why? Because of the things that have not yet been revealed to man. We have no illumination if we're living on yesterday's manna. We are living wholly in material consciousness if we're trying to hold on to anything or anybody. Loose them and let them go because manna falls day by day and the more receptive we are the greater the measure that we receive. The more we try to fill our mind with what we knew yesterday, the more we block the possibility of a new unfoldment today and tomorrow. That is why in our work no one should ever believe that they know how to treat any particular claim. I don't care if they've met a hundred cases of it. They should still feel that they do not know how to treat it. Why? Because every treatment should be an individual treatment because it should be an individual unfoldment from God. Now, one person has a cold, another one has a cold, another one has a cold, and you would think then that one truth would meet all three of them, but it doesn't. It doesn't. It takes an individual unfoldment. Ah, it is true that as you get into the fourth dimensional consciousness, you're not dealing with treatment because you have already receive the enlightenment, the enlightened consciousness that doesn't accept appearances. But remember that in almost every department of life we are seeking more illumination, more light today than we had yesterday. And we can't do it if we're holding on to yesterday's manner. So it is. The third dimensional consciousness, the three-dimensional consciousness, is always thinking in the forms of the concreteness of that which has form. But the fourth dimensional consciousness sees no concreteness there, but looks through it 
and finds the concreteness in the invisible. The real substance is in the invisible. The invisible which I am, or the invisible I am which I am, the invisible being which I am, the invisible life which I am, the invisible omnipresence which I am. All this seems so intangible that you cannot get your mind to grasp it. And that's your safety and security. Because if your mind could grasp it, be assured that isn't it. The fourth dimensional consciousness, Christ consciousness, or your consciousness when it's illumined, doesn't have to labor whether in healing work or any other form of work. It just has to be a state of receptivity because it is always receiving grace or it is always receiving by grace. It is always receiving nourishment because I have meat. Invisible, omnipresent meat. Bread, wine, water, substance, law, activity. I have meat. There is more power in the realization that I have meat the world knows not of. I have meat that ye know not of. I embody within myself the divine substance of all form. There is more power in that than in all of the external world that you could attract to yourself. Because with this inner realization, it will multiply itself over and over and over again like the plants keep multiplying leaves and flowers and fruit. It's just a steady state of multiplication once you realize within this within this within me is the kingdom of God the kingdom of allness and it does something to you up here in releasing you from looking out here seeking out here desiring out here and in the end it is desirelessness that attests the degree of demonstration. Desirelessness attests the degree of demonstration. You can tell by the degree in which you are no longer desiring from the outside world the measure of your progress. In the same way, you can measure your progress spiritually by watching your own reaction. The less you feel called upon to use a power, the higher you're going spiritually. The less use you find for powers, even God powers, the more you're advancing spiritually because you're getting closer and closer to the realm of is. God is. There is nothing we can say, do, or think that is going to make God do something. And as a matter of fact, the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. It is not of this world. And the more we try to use it in this world, the further we are from the attainment of spiritual enlightenment. We are free in proportion as we are not seeking powers, even spiritual powers, but are relaxing in uh, non-power. Resist not evil is uh, the realm of the fourth dimension. Resist not evil. Now, why not? In the other dimension, he says, Resist evil and it will flee from you. That's in your humanhood. 
and your humanhood in the third dimension where you have to resist temptation, uh, where you have to uh, fight back at error, fight fire with fire. But in the fourth dimension, resist not evil. What did hinder you? They have only the arm of flesh. And the more you relax, in this assurance, the more you're in the fourth dimension, the higher the state of your illumination. And you can feel that up here in the forehead because there is the first place where you feel when you're trying to get a power. You can feel the strain up here and you can feel the release that comes when you realize, I don't need a power. If there are not two powers, what do I need a power for? And then that release comes. It comes up here. Sometimes it comes in the back of the neck. But when it comes, it can only come because you've had some measure of enlightenment that says to you, if there's only one power, what am I looking for another power for? If there is only one power then I'm in that power, and that power is in me. I and it and it and me. I and you and you, so and so on. <clears throat> See what illumination does. It frees you from man whose breath is in his nostril. It frees you from the fear, hate, love of any form of external. It frees you even from the need for God. Now, some of you undoubtedly read, maybe all of you, the uh, answers in the newspaper from these different ministers as to the Supreme Court decision on the subject of prayer. And you probably noticed the Buddhist who says that he's very glad that they don't have that prayer because in Buddhism they don't have any such God. Well, now, you could speak to a lot of people who have uh, read comparative religion, and they'll tell you that Buddhism has no God. Well, in that sense, it's true. Buddhism has no God, no God separate from man. Buddhism declares that the only God there is is your enlightened consciousness. When you are enlightened... Uh, that enlightenment is Buddha, God, Christ. Well, none of the Occidental religions have quite uh, caught up to that, but actually, this is uh, undoubtedly the meaning of the infinite way, because I read the other day in a transcript of our Los Angeles class where it says, there is not a God. There is not a God. Of course there is not a God. If there were a God, let's go out and find him and bring him down here and get him to do something. The nature of God is light or enlightenment. But since you can never know light except through your consciousness, it is only your enlightened consciousness that constitutes your God. Consciousness itself is God. But consciousness is manifested as the consciousness of individual being, not only humans, animals, minerals, and vegetables at different levels of consciousness. Master says, if you turn over a stone, you'll find me. Consciousness, the universal consciousness, is individually expressed. And your consciousness is that consciousness, but not until the moment of illumination. 
up until the moment of illumination, you are the natural man who receiveth not the things of God. You are not under the law of God, neither indeed can be. That is why there is a difference between continuity of life after death and immortality. The continuity of life after death is just a continuity of the same state of consciousness that existed prior to death. This is continuity of life after death. It is no assurance of immortality. It is only the assurance of uh, the next stage. Immortality is the expansion of your consciousness to the point of infinity. Only when you reach the stage when you realize God as your consciousness have you reached the stage of immortality. So it is. The human being is born, grows up, matures, decays, and dies. All of this as a separateness apart from God. All of this in a personal selfhood that has in it no element of spiritual law, spiritual life, spiritual creation. It is purely an animal life. That is why even when the heart's going or gone, you can keep it going with a drug. Now, you're not keeping God life going with a drug. You're keeping your animal life going with a drug. The God life can't be affected with or without a drug. But the human life can. You have to see this difference between the natural man not under the law of God, not receiving the things of God, the man who lives like a vegetable is fed by foods alone. And uh, the individual that you are in the moment that some measure of illumination takes place, in which you no longer live by bread alone, but by every word, that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The individual that you are, when you are not being fed just by books, but when you're being taught of God, when inner light is coming to you directly from within, when you find yourself experiencing occurrences of grace, experiences that we don't earn or deserve, which yet come to us. So you must see this. There is a place, and you see all of you have experienced some measure of this illumination. Could be tiny, but it's there. Every one of you has been touched to some extent by it. But you can see that it will be in the degree of that illumination that you will attain your freedom. And freedom is the goal. Freedom from personal sense, freedom from material sense, freedom from living on externals, freedom from outer dependencies, a freedom that enables us to tabernacle, commune, with our inner selfhood, our spiritual nature, and then watch the flow as it comes up from within and flows outward, not only blessing us, but eventually making us forget ourselves and uh, using us only as instruments for the blessing of others. We have freedom from sin, we have freedom from disease, we have freedom from death, we have freedom from lack and limitation. 
but only in the degree that we attain the spiritual freedom which comes from illumination. Because without illumination, no more power is given to the things or thoughts of the outer world then no more power is given to the need for a God power. Because now we're in the realization of the one and only power that is functioning. And it functions without help from the human. In the ancient teaching of <clears throat> Lao Tzu, they said that you don't live by food, you don't live by persons, you don't live by anything in the external. You live by Tao. But there is no meaning for that word Tao. Not even in Chinese is there a meaning for it. Therefore, it can't be defined. It's something you are supposed to know or feel. I suppose you could just as well say live by the unknowable or love by the, live by the invisible. But it means the same. This ability up here in the forehead to relax. I don't have to know anything. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to draw any powers out of the air. I don't need any miracle powers. I don't need any miracle workers. I don't need man whose breath is in his nostril, even if he's a spiritual light. Why? Because I and my father are one. I know no life divided. The life of God is my life. The mind of God is my mind. The consciousness of God is my consciousness. The soul of God is my soul. I and my Father are one. And at some period of study or meditation, the light dawns. And whereas before I knew the truth intellectually, now I feel it, now I see it, now I comprehend it, now I live it. It's really a great miracle that comes into your life once you can sit back and look out at all the people in the world, those close to you as well as those far away from you, and realize, just think, we can tabernacle together, we can be friendly together, we can live together, we can do anything we like, but I and my father are one. That, that sense of oneness yet separateness, a lack of dependence, and yet a circle of joy and of sharing. It's a miracle when it happens. It's a miracle when you're set free within yourself and can realize, just think, I live by grace, not by might nor by power, not by anyone's favor. I live by grace. Because I and the Father are one. This is the supreme freedom. This is the supreme freedom. The moment you have that feeling of oneness with your source and then can see everybody out here and have no sense of need, attachment, drawing each one a free individual unit in oneness with their father. I believe that this is the height of freedom. 
It's one of the last freedoms to be obtained. It seems so much easier to be free of places or things than to be free of persons. And it is for this reason that when we have attained our freedom from persons or our freedom in our spiritual oneness, that we are then united with all on a spiritual basis. There's no relationship like it in all the world. It can't be described. You can't possibly know what it feels like to love everybody because you don't need them and because you know they don't need you. But each one is free and complete in and of themselves. The greatest freedom that can come on earth. And the strange part is that in attaining that freedom, you find yourself bound to people throughout the world. Drawn to them, and they're drawn to you. But in freedom, always in freedom. Now for a minute, take this uh, statement, I have meat the world knows not of. If necessary, repeat it within you and see if you don't get a measure of release when you say it, when you remember it. I have meat the world knows not of. There should be a feeling of release because up to that moment there has been present the belief that there is something yet to be obtained or attained in the outer world. And with each remembrance of this statement, no, I have meat, the world knows not of, there should be an inner release, an inner freedom as if the mind withdrew itself from trying to get something outside. And the more you live with this statement, the greater the spiritual light will ultimately unfold. I have meat. It means I'm not dependent on getting anything, attaining anything, accomplishing anything. I have meat. I have meat the world knows not of, a spiritual source, a spiritual oneness with my source, with the Father. I have my inner contact with my source. And then you can sit for a minute or two in a, a silent pause and let yourself be fed from within, even though you have no feeling or thought of being fed, but it's taking place invisibly, because of invisible omnipresence. All of this good, remember, exists in the invisible. It exists in omnipresence within you. And that's why you can say, thank you, Father, I have meat. That which I am seeking, I am. I already embody the kingdom of the Father, the kingdom of allness is within me. And then the mind relaxes, gives up its attempt to get something, and in that inner peace, that's when the good unfolds. There is a spirit in man now, when you take that statement, 
don't be satisfied just to repeat it because that's vain repetition there is a spirit in man there is the spirit of God in man there is the spirit of life in man there is a spirit of abundance in man there is a spirit of wisdom in man there is the spirit of his presence in man in me and in you that is a spirit in man just this one statement is food it's more than food it's food and clothing and housing there is a spirit in me there is a spirit of God in me and in you there is a spirit of love there is a spirit of peace there is a spirit of comfort there is the spirit of the divine kingdom within me and within you and you see as we dwell on that again the mind yields up its strain and the moment it yields up its strain you're right living in the spirit and with the spirit and through the spirit there's a spirit in man I live not by bread but through the spirit of God I live through the Spirit of God. I live by the Spirit of God. I live by the Spirit of God, not by the externals. Not by the external things, thoughts, or persons. I live by the Spirit of God. And this is the real meaning of the life of withinness of the mystical life that lives on and through the spirit rather than on and through the material world <clears throat> you can't rightly say within this you cannot rightly say that you're living the spiritual life unless you're living by the spirit and in the spirit and through the spirit and that releases you from all attachment to this outer universe you have no fears no hopes no ambitions about it you're only living the spiritual life when you're living in the spirit through the spirit by the spirit yeah. and so it is thank you All of the original great religious teachings of the world have been called paths or ways, the path or the way. And I'm sure that no better designation could be found because the function of a religious teaching is to bring to us eventually the awareness of our true identity, of our true name and nature the purpose of religion is to reveal to us the secret of life the secrets that have been hidden because of human inability to grasp the knowledge the understanding of the underlying principles of existence when you see trees growing plants growing you are seeing the effect of some invisible laws that are operating you are not seeing that which produces the tree not even when you see the seed do you see that which produces the tree 
because the seed itself is an effect. Behind the seed, there is a law, a law that functions and carries the seed all the way through to uh, fruitage, whether in the form of flowers, buds, fruit, vegetables, whatever it may be. In the same way, in what we call human creation, you see none of the law that is behind this creation. You see the creation from the seed to the human being, to the babe, and ultimately to the adult, but you never see the law that underlies. Now, it is because of this that the world has been hypnotized through the centuries by appearances, and it judges all of its values by appearances and rarely takes into consideration that there is a law behind this visible universe, a law that functions this universe, a law that is also the substance, the cause, the activity, the continuity, and the progress of this universe. Therefore, as humans, we disregard the laws of life and we come into all of the troubles and discords and inharmonies of the human world. We do not take into consideration the fact that behind this world there are laws, and that in order to prosper, I use that word prosper in its complete sense, to be fruitful, that we must live in accord with the laws, not in accord with our will or desire. In nature, we obey those laws, in that we do not plant uh, orchids up in Maine unless we do it inside of a hothouse. Nor do we plant citrus fruit in New England. When we do our planting, we take into consideration the laws of nature and then decide where we should plant and also what manner of uh, soil, what manner of fertilizing will be necessary. But with our own lives, we act as human beings as if there were no laws that we could make up our laws as we go along, much as we make up our legal laws. <clears throat> we make up our legal laws just to suit the emergencies of today. When that emergency is over, we disregard that law and make another law. But this cannot be done with our lives. With our lives, there is a way, there is a path that we must tread, there is a way that we must understand, and we must take that way. We don't, as human beings. That is why we are in trouble with each other. That is why we are in antagonism with the laws of the universe. In revealing the way of life, the great masters who brought forth the original teachings on which even modern religions are built, these masters knew 
the laws behind this world, the invisible laws. And they taught how we are to live in accord with these laws, how we are to bring ourselves into harmony with these laws. And they promise, as the Master did, that if we follow this way, we will bear fruit richly. In other words, we will have the laws of life working with us instead of our working in antagonism to them. In our human ignorance, we accept the appearance that we are born barren. We come into this world with no clothing. Most people come into this world with no money. And working from that basis, almost from the beginning, we try to add to ourselves. It makes no difference whether it's a baby trying to take some other baby's rattle away from it, or whether it is a nation that is trying to take somebody else's land or industry away from it. The human life is the assumption that I have nothing, and therefore I must get it, work for it, plan for it, even plot for it, eventually steal, rob, murder for it. Anything goes in the human picture as long as uh, we get that which we are seeking. Then there are those who reach a stage in which they realize the futility of this constant labor for those things that perish. Labor, striving and struggle for things that after you get them prove to be shadows, substanceless shadows, not satisfying, not quenching, and it is at this stage that we turn to religious teachings. And for the most part, we turn from this seeking in the outer realm to a seeking from God, that which we have not heretofore succeeded in getting materially, our health, our abundance, our happiness, we now expect to get from God. And fortunately, even though it is only an entrance to the path or the way, it is at least an opening wedge because it does turn us from the belief that we can get from the material world that which will satisfy to a closer view of truth, that is, that there is some invisible source from which our good may come or through which our good may come. then you can see that religion, any religion, might rightly call itself a way or the way or a path because it is a way and it is a path of seeking in some other direction than material sense. Those of you who have failed, even in the religious world, to find God 
an open door to health, wealth, and success, are naturally called upon to seek further for the way or to seek the meaning of the way. In uh, the Master's revelation, the entire experience of his ministry was called the way. All the way through it was known by his disciples, by others, as the way. And of course, always the struggle was, what is that way? Those who were not of the inside group were always wondering, what is that way of uh, the Master? What is this way he talks about? To his disciples, of course, he revealed, I am the way. We do not have any reason to believe that the disciples understood the meaning of that. But one thing is certain to us as we seek the way, and that is this. Those words, I am the way, were spoken by a Hebrew rabbi. And therefore, he could not have been referring to any human being as the way, because if there is any religion in the world that does not permit the deification of a human being, it is the Hebrew faith. In fact, as you know, they do not even permit a carving or a picture that would represent deity. So that under no consideration could the Master have been referring to any individual or any human being as being the way. And so when he says, I am the way, the first question that must come to our thought is, what is meant by I or I am? The moment this comes to our thought, we are instantly reminded of Moses, because here too we have the same statement, I am that I am. Again, what would seem to be the glorification of a human being, but which we know by the nature of the entire Hebrew teaching could not have been meant. I am that I am, and uh, nobody even believed for a moment that Moses was referring to his humanhood as being I am, or God. And so again, we have to come back, if we are seeking the way of harmonious living, if we are seeking the way of the true life, we must come back to Moses, and we must come back to Christ Jesus, and see if we cannot fathom the meaning of I am the way, or I am that I am, and yet not glorify our humanhood, not try to set up our human selfhood as God, because this would utterly destroy us. There comes a time on this way, on this path, when in your meditation you begin to understand why the Master taught, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, or wherewithal you shall be clothed. 
you begin to perceive why he could refrain from praying for things. He made it very clear. Ye are children of God and of children heirs. If you are children of God and heirs of God, not only do you not get from the outside world, you do not even get from an inside world because you already have. Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. As an heir of God, you already have all that the Father hath. It is already yours by inheritance. And so, you not only in this catch a glimpse of the way, but also of why this way is difficult. And let us witness that right now. Because once you understand the true nature of prayer, you begin to understand not only the nature of God, but the nature of the entire spiritual way that leads to bearing fruit richly. Now, think of this. As a matter of fact, let us pray. Let us pray together. Let us unite in a meditation in which we are going to acknowledge above all things the Father speaking to us from within and saying, Son, thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine. Now ponder that until you can actually feel that if all that the Father hath is mine, I am only resting in prayer when I rest in that word. In fact, I am only truly praying when I am resting in that word. There is nothing for me to seek, not even from God, since I and the Father are one, and all that the Father hath is mine. Since I and my Father are one, infinity is the measure of my being, not by any egotistical sense of my greatness, but by my awareness of this truth that I and the Father are one. And it is in this oneness with God that the mind of God is my mind. The life of God is my life. The abundance of God is my abundance. Not by virtue of myself, I and my own self have nothing. If I speak of myself separate and apart from God, I bear witness to a lie. But if I can accept the way the way of oneness, the way which declares, Thou seest me, Thou seest the Father that sent me, for I and the Father are one. The spiritual way, then, that results in bearing fruit richly is the awareness 
the acknowledgement of our oneness with our source. Now, this word God must no longer baffle us or puzzle us or mystify us. We must understand God as the creative principle of this entire universe. We must understand God as the source of all that is, the invisible source of all that appears visibly. In other words, the invisible source of my visible being. Since I and my Father are one, I am united to God, I am united to my source by this relationship of sonship, oneness. In my oneness with God, I am God-ordained, God-maintained, God-sustained. In my relationship of sonship, all that the Father hath is mine. All that the Father is, I am. Like Father, like Son, the nature of God must be the nature of the offspring of God. And God is spirit. The nature of my being must be spiritual. The nature of God is spirit, then the nature of the law of God must be spiritual. This is important to remember because if your religion is to be the way, it must point out to you the way of life. The way of life is spiritual. The way of the law of life is spiritual. The nature of God is the nature of creation. This is the way to know this. We always come back then to, ah, I have meat the world knows not of. I have meat ye know not of. Do I have it because I'm somebody important? No. Do I have it because I have obeyed the Ten Commandments? No. I have it by virtue of my relationship to my source, sonship. This is the way. This is the way, walk ye in it, the way of acknowledgement of your sonship, of your oneness, and then not even seeking from God, but acknowledging that already God has breathed into us his breath of life. Therefore, we have it. God has imparted to us his mind. Therefore, we have it. God has imparted to us his wisdom. Therefore, we have it. God has given unto us his grace. Therefore, we have it. Think what this does to your prayer. It makes of prayer a rejoicing, a rejoicing in the truth, a rejoicing that we have found the way. The way is sonship. The way is oneness. This is the way to bear fruit richly. Only through the acknowledgement of oneness. Regardless of what appearance touches your life in the form of sin, 
the form of illness, the form of lack, the form of unhappy human relationships, the way to surmount these is the way of sonship or oneness. And this way can only be walked by you. No one can walk it for you. Your spiritual teachers can be your guides on the way. Your spiritual teachers can smooth your path today or tomorrow. But only you can take the way. Only you can live by the way. Only you can walk the way. And this is done as an activity of your consciousness. In other words, it is done by virtue of your conscious knowing the truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What is the truth that you shall know? You shall know the truth of the way. I am the way. By virtue of my oneness with my source, I am infinite. By virtue of my oneness with my source, I am spiritual. By virtue of my oneness with my source, I am under spiritual law, which means grace. I am under grace, not under the law of matter, but under grace. The way we know. The way is oneness, sonship, and living in this word. Acknowledging this relationship morning, noon, and night. And so governing our prayer that our prayer is a constant recognition of this truth rather than the acknowledgement of being a vacuum that we want filled or being barren and wanting something added to us. It is a form of self-malpractice to acknowledge barrenness, to acknowledge the absence of any good thing. Ah, yes, we know the appearances. To all of us, there seems to be some form of divine grace missing. Some more, some less. But what we are dealing with at the present moment is not the appearances, but the way in which the appearances are made to disappear. The way in which to surmount the difficulties of the moment the way in which we are to enter the spiritual kingdom, the way in which we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that way is oneness, sonship. Sonship, oneness. I and my Father are one. The I which is God is the I which is me because of oneness. And the relationship between the I which is God and the I which is me is oneness, sonship. Now we know why I can of my own self do nothing. Or be nothing. It is because that would be a false sense of selfhood. Whereas all things are possible to me by virtue of my relationship to my source. It is really the source pouring itself 
forth into expression as me. Now, the Master in teaching reveals also that love is the way. So now we have to seek in still another direction. Love is the way. Definitely, the study of Scripture will reveal that the ordinary human sense of love is not sufficient to be the way. There must be a higher sense of love. Now just think, love is the way. That is, love is the way to harmony. Love is the way to peace. Love is the way to health. Love is the way to abundance. And if we would walk in the Master's way, we must walk with love. We must tabernacle with love. We must experience love. We must express love. But, again, we dare not look to another to love us. That is no part of the spiritual way. We have no right in the Master's teaching to seek love from anyone. The Master's way of declaring that love is the way is express love. Be love in action. Do not look outside for someone else to do it or be it. Because we are concerned at this moment not with their demonstration. We are not concerned with whether or not they ever find the way. We are not concerned at this moment with whether anyone comes into spiritual fruitage except myself. I am responsible at this moment only for myself. And the reason is this, that until I make my demonstration, until I attain the way, I have nothing to give or share with the rest of the world. So if I'm going to start to give and to share before I have, I'm certainly going to make a mess of the entire situation. Therefore, I'm not going to think now about what your demonstration is. I'm going to think about mine. For I am seeking the way. And I wish to live the way. I wish to live the way of Christ. Even if it's for the selfish motive that I may, may bear fruit richly. Regardless of my reason, I must live the way. I can find no permanent happiness, no permanent peace, until I have found the way of life. And I know by the teacher that the way of life is love. Therefore, I am called upon not to seek love, but to express love. In what manner? First of all, not merely to my friends and relatives, because to pray for my friends, it profiteth me nothing. Certainly, if I pray for my friends alone, or for those of my own household alone, it profiteth me nothing. To love, I must be prepared to pray for my enemy. I must be prepared to pray that God's grace touch my enemy. 
I must be prepared to forgive. Now, under the Master's revelation, we can find it very easy to forgive, much easier than uh, you imagine. Because the Master has revealed that all evil is done in ignorance. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. In other words, forgiving really becomes a matter of understanding, understanding the nature of evil that it is an impersonal thing. No person in and of themselves are evil. There is always a prompting, an outside influence that brings it about. Of course, we know what it is, because we have discovered that the basis of all evil is revealed in a law of human nature, the law that says self-preservation is the first law of nature. This is really one of the greatest sources of evil because it is on this law that we base our right to kill others, that we even condone it to the extent of not punishing some who kill others because they're preserving their own. Therefore, the wrongs we commit are not natural to you or to me. They are the product of the ignorance that has been instilled in us that makes us believe that we have the right to be evil, to do evil, under certain circumstances. Therefore, it should be so easy to realize, just as I have been mistaught on this subject, so has the rest of the world. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Again, we are taught, with the Master's example, that inasmuch as ye have done a good thing, unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Inasmuch as ye have done a bad thing unto the least of these my brethren ye have done a bad thing unto myself now this is the way walk ye in it this is the way realize that every bit of good every bit of love that you express is a love that is expressed to you you may believe for a moment that you're expressing love to the hungry Chinese. Or the abandoned Cubans. You're not. You are expressing love unto yourself because the self of that other is the self of you. This is the way. Recognize that there is but one self. I am that self. I am that self even if I am appearing as you. I am that self even when I am appearing as the beggar, the thief. Isn't it easy to forgive knowing that I am forgiving myself? I'm forgiving my own ignorance, my own ignorance when it appears as someone else. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Do you hear that? Love is the fulfilling of the law, the law of life, the law of grace, the law of God. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Therefore, love is the way. And this means the love that I 
express. For I am the way. I must express love, forgiveness, patience. I must pray that the light of the world be revealed even in the darkest consciousness. I must do unto others as I would have others do unto me, because the eye of me is the eye of the other. We are only one. In the recognition of this oneness, and now do you see where we are again? We are back at the very beginning of this revelation. Oneness and sonship. The self of me is the self of you because there is only one self and this is God's self. Therefore, the spiritual way of life is in my recognition of oneness, sonship. I am one with God. I am one with you. And this oneness constitutes my sonship. And this oneness constitutes your sonship. Therefore, the way of the Master is oneness, sonship. Expressed through love, through the understanding of this truth, you see that I am the way brings the recognition that the I of me and the I of you is the same I. The I am that I am is the I am that you are, because this is the I am that God is, and God is the I am which is the I am of you, and the I am of me, and therefore I am is the way. The recognition of I amness is the way. And this brings us back to the two great commandments of the Master. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thy neighbor is thyself. Thyself is thy neighbor. And here you have oneness. And in this oneness, you have sonship. You cannot love God whom you have not seen, except in proportion, as you are loving your neighbor because the I am God is the I am of your neighbor even as the I am God is the I am of you of me for we are one in Christ Jesus we are one in spiritual sonship Christ Jesus is the name of the Son of God. Therefore, we are one in spiritual sonship. Ah, never think for a moment that the boundaries of this room include that oneness and that sonship. Ah, no. There are no boundaries in spiritual relationship for there is only one I am, and that I am is universal, individually ma manifested and expressed as every individual, past, present, and future. It is for this reason 
men, individual you and me. We have never had a beginning. We did not begin with our birth. We merely became visible at this point of experience. The Christ was not born just when Peter said, Thou art the Christ. The Christ had always been there, even before Abraham was. But it was at that moment that Peter recognized the Christ. You were not born on your birthday. You merely became visible on this plane of existence. But you had existed before, as you will exist after, because I am the way. I am the only life. And I am before Abraham was, for I am as God. I am is the way. I am the life of you. And I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will be with thee to the end of the world. Therefore, I am is the way. And the more you dwell in the remembrance of your true identity, the closer you are living to the way. Do you see why you do not have to pray to any powers for anything? Your prayer is an acknowledgement. I am the way. And rest in that truth. Rest in that truth. Your spiritual discernment will reveal to you the meaning of I am the way. Don't take it as a person saying this to you. Take it as the voice whispering it to you within your own being that you won't make the mistake again of glorifying an individual. This is the voice of God speaking to you from within your own being and saying to you, I am the way. I am with you. I am thy bread, thy wine, thy water. I am the resurrection even unto your past. And I will be with thee unto the end of the world. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And this is it. I am is the way. You are living in this I amness. But always loving your neighbor as yourself with the recognition that this is the truth about me, and this is the truth about the starving Chinese. This is the truth about the belabored Cubans. This is the truth equally everywhere, and our awareness of this truth may awaken them to the awareness of their true identity. All religion is trying to point out to you the way of salvation, the way of harmony, the way of peace, and it is revealed unto you what that way is. I am the way. And this I amness is oneness and sonship, and it constitutes the brotherhood of man. There is no other brotherhood of man except our united relationship in God. I am the Father, I am the Son. And it is because of this sonship that we have the relationship of brotherhood. Our only brotherhood is a spiritual relationship 
based on our understanding of our oneness with our source. The way is oneness, sonship. The way is love. The way is the recognition of our true identity. The way is the recognition of the nature of God and the nature of the Son and the nature of prayer. I am the way and if you take this passage as a sacred secret, as a pearl not to be thrown before the unillumined thought, I have found the way. I am the way. I am is the life of me and the life of you. I am is the immortality of me and the immortality of you. I am is the divine grace by which we live. Thank you.